the 1971 Plymouth Hemi Cuda is the most collectible Mopar muscle car on the planet. With an auction record sale of $3.5 million, no one can argue that when Mopar made the 71 Cuda, they set the bar so high it will likely never be reached again. Plymouth made just 107 1971 Hemi Cuda hardtops. Of those, 59 were built with a four-speed manual transmission, and only 48 featured the 727 Torque Flight automatic transmission. The Cuda for 71 was all new. It featured fish gill simulated fender scoops and the unique recessed grille that came in matching body color. And of course, the one year only four headlamp lighting system. And if it was a Hemi, it came with the imposing shaker hood that called out Hemi Cuda. This Cuda features the L31 optional road lamps, V6W, white billboard stripes, H6X9, full vinyl bucket seats with C16 center console, slapstick shifter, R11 Music Master AM radio, and of course, air conditioning wasn't available on the Hemi. Raleigh Instrument Cluster A62 was added to include the 8,000 RPM tachometer. Sales code S83 got you the sporty and classy rim blow steering wheel. J45 hood pin tie downs were standard on all CUDA models. L31 turn signal indicators make for a cool option and safety feature. And to top off this one of a kind, very special build, it features the J81 Gall Wing Spoiler and J68 back light louvers, all making this a true supercar in every sense of the word. Fantastic job. Thank you, buddy. You're the man. Appreciate it. Great job. All right. But as they say in TV land, folks, stay tuned, because this fish comes with a twist you did not see coming. Hi, my name is Brian. I'm pretty new to the team here. I've been here just almost a year now, which is pretty cool. I'll tell you what, I learned something new every single day here. It's, it's one of the greatest things in the world. You come in and you leave with more knowledge than you had when you got here in the morning. It's pretty neat. This black Cuda, Mark and I worked really closely on this car. It's the first car I completed here. We went over this thing every day, and at the end of the day, we had a lot of head scratching moments. One of the greatest things about being here at Graveyard Cars is working with Mark and Doug. And working with those guys on the final QC on this car was phenomenal. Very much so when we, when we do the final walkthrough, it's amazing what I learned from those guys. There's a wealth of knowledge there. I love picking their brains. All right, so this first mark right here. So one of the last things that we do before a car actually gets shipped out is the final QC. And, and during this process, that's where we make sure everything fits in the finish and all those things are proper. But we also go through and do our assembly line markings, all of the information labels. These are things that I do on every car, even if a car weren't 100% OEM, even if it was like some of the rest of the models we've done for like Martinez and the SEMA cars, I still do that because I wanna keep it in the spirit of OEM. It doesn't have to be perfect. Remember, these guys were just doing a, a swatch of paint down there. So that's a little rim brandy right there. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. And when I say a dab or a daub of paint, 
We've already gone through and checked everything like that. So now we just need to let the guy know at home that we checked it. Got it. And we need to let ourselves know that we checked it. So that's what the white's gonna represent. White is it checked, okay. So go ahead and do your inside lower control arm there. Oh, Picasso there. There you go. Okay. Do the front one. All right. All right, and then these right here. Yep. Other than the daily problem solving that I have to do, one of the greatest things that I've learned here, one of the most fun things that I've learned here is about all of the, the assembly line markings that go on these cars, the final markings, and all of the labels that go on these cars, all of the factory labels. Learning where and why they go in certain places on the car is fascinating. It's, a, it's amazing to think about all of these things that they were doing 50 years ago, and learning why now, it's incredible. So this car does have some aftermarket pieces on it, and that means when it comes time to doing assembly line markings and information labels, it won't line up exactly the way it would if those components were in place. But we do our best, even if it isn't the exact same transmission or the exact same control arm. Four nuts on each leaf spring. Four on that side. Give me a daub at the bottom of the shock nut right there and go on to the washer a little. That's okay. exactly it. All right, so now we're going to set that down and, and let's go to a blue. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and do a daub right there on that drain plug. Little just blue. so everybody knows we checked it. Just on the plug or just onto the... Anything, be sloppy. Okay. Oh, matter. be sloppy, okay. Yeah, there we go. yeah they, were, they were very fast. <laughs> And then give me one on the dipstick tube to show that we filled it. There we go. All right. Just for the record, for those of you who have been following us forever, back 10 years ago when we started this, we still use the Dave Weiss books. We still use the OEM gold judging books that have so much information in them for us to be able to put these cars back the way they were when they were OEM. We've contributed to those books over the years, but we've also found things that we like to use ourselves that we have seen that haven't shown up in the book. Give me a daub right there on the filler. All right, okay. Once we had all of the paint markings done, Mark came over and helped me install the information labels. Okay, so grab your ethylene glycol warning label from the table, it's gonna go right, right. in here. Let's and before right you here. peel the backing off, just kind of mock it to where you like the looks of it at. So we get all of these information labels from ECS Automotive. ECS is actually the only company that Chrysler authorizes to make some of these special labels. Where each label goes in space is important. Mark knows where to put all the labels off the top of his head, it's amazing. Myself, I have to refer to the ECS catalog. The catalog is great because it shows you where each part number label goes on the wiring harness. It even tells you which direction to wrap the wiring label. Sometimes we fold it, sometimes we wrap it. The catalog tells us everything we need to know. All right, so go ahead and grab your emission decal. We can do that one next. All right, so. Are we gonna be able to read it from here or read yep. it from the you inside? You wanna read it from standing out here. Okay. So Brian hasn't been with us a long time, I think six months or so. And when you're training a newbie that has mechanical skills, cause he does have mechanical skills, even though he was a GM guy before he came here. There are things beyond just mechanical that you have to teach them that are Mopar-esque. So there is a massive, massive learning curve to go from working on a 69 Chevelle or a 70 Chevelle into working on a 70 Cooter or 71 Cooter or a B body or an E body. These are the kind of skill sets that I have to work one-on-one -on -one with each guy. I did it with his predecessors, but he is showing the very, very most promise of any of the technicians that I've worked with in recent past.
My job on the 71 Hemi Cuda was to make sure that everything on the drivetrain was built out and ready to install when the time came. I worked with Mark for a long time, and even though that everything we put on these cars is not factory OEM for these custom builds that we do, we have to try to make this stuff appear OEM using the right fasteners, the right markings on the fasteners. We try to do the best we can to make these look factory appearing when we're done. So even though we added the Magnum Force front suspension and the Silver Sport automatic transmission, we wanted to make this look like it started life in the car. So when I got the engine built, I dressed it out with correct date coated plug wires, heater hoses, and alternator. We also used the correct Hemi pulleys. You name it, as much as I could put on to make this factory OEM, I did. What a miracle. <laughs> With Mark and Hunter's help, we installed the drivetrain just the way the factory would have done it. After that, the customer wanted Krager SS wheels and BF Goodrich TA radial tires. So I mounted up the wheels and tires, we installed them on the car, and we made this a roller. The first 426 Hemi engine ever rebuilt and restored at Graveyard Cars came from a very rusty and very rare 1970 Dodge Charger RT. 426 Hemi, one of 56 made, 410 Dana Super Track Pack. This car is all numbers, numbers motor, numbers transmission, all original car. Most of the paint on it's original. Like most cars at the Graveyard, this Charger had a checkered past. After its clutch failed, the car was parked and sat for over 30 years. So while its highly desirable Hemi engine was the original numbers matching mill, it had sat for over three decades and sadly, it had seized up. Once the intake manifold, distributor, exhaust manifolds, wiring, fuel lines, and cylinder heads were removed, the real challenge of rescuing this engine began. Resulting from the decades of decay and immobility, the number two piston was seized in the cylinder and had to be chiseled out. She's frozen solid. If you force one right there, you can end up breaking uh, the ring up against the piston, causing damage in the actual cylinder wall itself. So we're gonna have to take the pan off of it, take the rest of it apart, and actually take the pistons out this direction. Pistons, we can buy new ones. They obviously need it. We're not gonna be able to save them anyway. The part you don't wanna sacrifice is the original numbers matching block and cylinder wall. And due to substantial pitting in the cylinder, a sleeve was required. After getting the engine back from the machine shop, the team reassembled it in OEM fashion. You know, it's a real treat for me to be able to work on engines like the 426 Hemi and the 440s and the six packs and the 346 packs and six barrels. You always have to take your time when you do it. But the Hemi is what really launched the top fuel dragsters into doing the things that they do today. The Hemi was durable. The hemispherical design of the head allowed that fuel in and out of there as fast as they could get it in and out of there. And of course, with a puffer or a blower on top, there was no restriction. The Hemi really created the world of drag racing that you see today. It was inspired and driven and motivated by the, by the Hemi. And fired it up on the engine run stand. When I get jazzed, when I get happy, when I get motivated, I dance. You don't like it too bad. It, it reminds me of the little town that didn't like the dancing going on and, and Kevin Bacon came to town and had to explain to him that even David said, sing and dance before the Lord. This epic build came to fruition in the season five finale when the ghouls unveiled this gorgeous burnt orange 1970 Charger RT 426 Hemi four speed in front of a live audience of thousands in an equally epic 
Stadium Reveal. I want to see Sluggo. Oh, man. Oh, nice try. You, you see my throw out there? About 100 miles an hour. They didn't, I, they don't, they don't measure it or anything, but it looked like it. You see, it went right across the plate, and that guy kind of went like that a little bit. So. paint black cars, I always do them apart, whether it be black or any solid color for that matter. So when it comes to a solid color, I do them in single stage. And basically for the people at home that may not know, this envision it like clear coat with color in it. So there's no need to clear, it's all in one. I like to try to get the body done first, get it all painted, get it cut and buffed, get it over to Brian. Then at that point, I can spray doors and fenders. As soon as those doors and fenders are done, we can get them buffed, go over and start installing them. While the doors and fenders are getting put on, I'll come back, do the hood, the deck lid, front and rear balances, and any parts and pieces. So when Josh is assembling the car, it pretty well goes seamlessly. There have been circumstances where I've painted all the parts first. Only downfall to that is you can't do anything with the parts until the body's shot. And because it's black, it's just basically a single stage toner. You don't have to worry about color match. You don't have to worry about anything. It's just put your four coats on and walk away. So as far as the engine on this car, it's a 426 Hemi, big boy. Goes Hemi orange, and it's the same thing we do on everyone. I take the Hemi orange, I leave the metallic out of it. Put three coats on, do a quick bake cycle on it, then kick it back to Doug. Then at that point, Doug's gonna realize the motor wasn't put together completely, send it back to me, paint it again, get it back to Doug, then we're good. The Hemi valve covers get a different type of finish. It's a wrinkled black finish, and then that's just done at a different time. Funny little thing I noticed here is that the cars that we've had the very, very most difficult time restoring, bringing back from the dead, have been 71 Cudas. Kind of interesting, right? Yeah, you know, we take Wendell's car, for example. That car burned to the ground, house exploded, Wendell almost died, horrible. Go back to the Phantom Cuda. I mean, for those of you who have been watching a long time, that car was a mess. Everything we bought for that car was transported in a four by eight manure trailer. And that wasn't much, it was basically a body. It had been hit on every panel, it had been sideswiped, had the nose knocked off of it, engine transmission were gone, rear end was gone, it picked apart for 25 years. When it came to Wendell's car, structurally the car was good, but it was all the outer stuff of the car was not good. So we had to replace the sheet metal before we could start squaring the car up. So we did a roof skin, quarters and doors, uh, then the fenders, hood and header, and front and rear balance. It was in real dire straits. It ended up needing so much metal. It was when I was complaining to Mike when he was out here from AMD, how much metal it needed. He volunteered to have his installation center work on that car. And they had their hands full on that car. Everything from the roof skin, quarter panels, inner and outer wheelhouses, trunk floor, trunk floor extension, rear body panel, cross member support, torsion bar cross member support, front frame rails, inner fenders. That car had an enormous amount of metal, but when watching them build that car, that's what inspired me to build our frame jigs that you see us using today. That's how they were able to build that one. Everything is in space in the right place because of this jig. We borrowed a branch from that tree and that's what we use today. You know, then it felt bad for Doug because this engine had been sitting for 20 plus years filled with water. You get that thing apart, it's like swamp inside there, but it's the original motor for the car, so there's no other option but take care of it, make sure it's all salvageable and put back in the car. When AMD brought that car back, it was so right 
is so square and so true that they were able to show me on the left door striker when they put it in place and took it out and put it in place, the original footprint of paint put that striker exactly where it was when the car got wrecked in 1980. That's perfection. Uh, factory EV2 Tour Red car, 446 barrel, real live Vico car. Dash VIN was in place, body numbers are in place, fender tag in place. It's a four speed car, it's one of 108 made. So with that car done right in the metal work, it was just a matter of us reassembling it. It gave us a shot at what we ultimately was able to do, which was save a one of 108 446 Barracuda. So when it came to the interior of the Phoenix Cuda, you obviously know what that's gonna be like because the car caught on fire. Everything from top to bottom had been melted and nothing was salvageable. We had to replace everything from the dash assembly to the heater box, seat frames, glass itself, the regulators, steering wheel, the radio, all the wiring, sill plates, you name it, it had to get replaced. So the Cuda wasn't just a challenge to put the body together, but like I said, it's putting the whole car together. The, there was no engine transmission or rear end to that car when it showed up here, so we had to locate a G440 representing a 1971 G440 HP block. Okay, got that from Tony, by the way, Tony's parts. Date coded correct Hemi four speed transmission, a date coded correct 354 Dana rear end. Then build it all out to OE spec so that when it is sitting there at the end of the day, looking amazing, you would never imagine that this car had suffered the blunt force trauma and the years of post accident trauma that it had by being left out in the field in the middle of nowhere, getting picked apart for 35 years and then with how bad that car was, it still didn't have the amount of hours that this black one took. This black one holds the record for how much time went into it, how big of a job it was from start to finish. So in the end, the car that they said couldn't be done, we did, 71 Phantom Cuda. It was written about in multiple magazines. It was talked about a lot in the internet. It's, it's really, it's the car that started Graveyard Cars because they said it couldn't be done. I said, we're gonna document it and the rest is history. So that car was saved. A lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of hours, a lot of parts. Our black 71 Hemi Cuda now, our tuxedo car with the white billboard. That car costs more money to build than that, took more time, more filming, and will be talked about as much or more than the Phantom car or any car subsequent to the Phantom car. Now, the main reason I bring up the most difficult cars that we've done is to give you a perspective on what's involved in it. And if you've been watching, you know that, but if you haven't been, you don't know what went into it. And even if you did watch it back in the day, you have to stop and realize that what we're doing here is we're duplicating history. So I don't get to just break out a catalog from Summit or Jegs or somebody and say, oh, send me all that stuff. Like a lot of the shows that you see on TV, they just order everything. Some of them fabricate a few things. We have to duplicate it. We have to find original parts when they're not being reproduced and restore them to OEM condition. We have to do the research and the history to make sure that when you are done with that one of 108 cars, that it's not just on the road again, but it is a duplicate to the way that it was on the day it was built. Chrysler Plymouth Sports Specialty Car, the Barracuda, has a new front end which features dual headlamps. The grille has been given a vertical styling theme. Louvers in the front fenders and new side trim highlight body styling changes. Rear styling is changed too with new tail lamps and backup lights integrated in the lower rear deck panel. This Cuda 340 model is one of six Barracudas available for 1971, including a sports coupe, hardtop, and convertible. Building the Hemi engine out for the black Hemi Cuda also gave me a chance to work with Alyssa. She's a lot of fun to work with, a lot better than working with her dad. So I've already cranked the engine around to where it's on top dead center, number one, and here on the damper, I've got the zeros lined up for yep. TDC, top dead center compression stroke, number one cylinder. Now you remember the engine cylinder orders. Yeah, they hop correct? back and forth. Uh -huh. So it's one, three, five, seven, and two, four, six, eight. I haven't adjusted valves on any engine before, let alone a Hemi engine. So it was awesome to work with Doug. He's always really sweet, easy to work with, like I've said a million times. I'm going to start running this adjusting screw down until we get to zero lash. Okay. 
So zero lash is when it gets hard to spin that because I've got all the play out of the rocker. So I've got okay. it backed off and you can feel some play, right? Yeah. You know, look, it's nothing personal against my dad, but if I have to learn something as intricate as adjusting valves on a Hemi, I'd much rather work with someone who's more like level-headed, like Dougie, not someone who's insane, like my dad. So now we've done our two intake valves and the intake valves are closest to the intake ports where the fuel goes in. The exhaust valves are on the outside closest to you, which is the exhaust ports on the outside of the head. And I already know what all you guys at home are saying. God, they said it a million times that, I, you know, he's your dad, you should learn from him. Oh God, growing up with Mark Warman, I bet you know everything there is in it. Look, how about you learn from him, okay? I've done my time in purgatory. What is it, like 32 years now? I'm good. One other favor. Mark got this intake system we have to put on this thing. Yeah. And there's a lot of reading. Could you help me with that? This is where I kind of got confused because Dougie handed me the instruction manual why am I getting this? I have no idea how to install this. I made Alyssa do all the reading and I just followed her instructions. My dad doesn't know how to do this either. That's what he, he says. Out here. Maybe you could help us with oh it. Oh my God. So my dad finally pulled me aside and explained to me why he handed me the instructions. And turns out guys don't read instructions, I guess. Are they scared of them? I mean, they don't trust them. I don't get it. But they don't ask for directions and they don't read instructions. Any, anything else? So the customer wanted an Edelbrock Pro Flow 4 induction system on this, which is a dual throttle body system. So all we have to do now is get some high tack around the gasket surfaces on top, and then I'll set the intake on. We'll put the screws in and we'll bolt it down. Easy. Okay, so is that, is that too thick or does that look good? Yeah, go right across everything. Rub it down to where it's thin. Like that? Perfect, And do yeah. I go across the- All the way. We have the intake ready. I've got the torque wrench ready. It's like nail polish. Nail polish. <laughs> so, so nail cool. polish, huh? Nail polish. Oh no! Right? It does look like nail polish. It's a beautiful color. <laughs> <laughs> so I did teach Alyssa how to torque the intake properly, but she had to add a twist to this. So as soon as we get this all snug down, we're gonna go ahead and torque them down. Torque down or torque? Torqued. Okay. Thought you were gonna about to torque for me, Doug. Wasn't sure. Huh? Thought you were gonna twerk for me. I wasn't sure. I can. Do you know what that is? Twerk? Yeah, like twerking. I don't. It's a dance. Uh, you know I can't dance. <laughs> they pulled a good prank on me. They caught me off guard that time. Do you wanna see what twerking actually is? The sure. type of dance I don't think you've ever seen before. Okay. Okay, Jeffrey. Let's check this out. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> You don't think you could do that? Well, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh, yeah, my knee's too stiff. It's not for everybody. Whoa, lady. Whoa. Let's get back to work, okay? <laughs> no twerking here. It'd be funny to see you try, though. The second Hemi to enter the graveyard queue belonged to Mr. Brett Torino and his ridiculously rare 1970 Coronet RT convertible. Only two of these cars were built with a manual transmission, and this is the only one left in existence. You're talking about a car that has the wildest engine available probably the wildest color available. It's a convertible top, it's a four-speed, it's a super track pack car. Sadly, the engine had suffered a spun bearing when the car was parked, and the block was an over-the-counter replacement from 1973. But fortunately, it still had an original bore. It's the first Hemi you installed? Yes. 426 cubic inch bad boy? Uh-huh. The machine work required to restore this engine included turning the crankshaft ten thousandths on the mains and ten thousandths on the rods. They bored the cylinders thirty thousandths over and installed new hyper eutectic pistons, balanced the engine, and installed a comp cam and lifters to ensure years of smooth running. The heads were rebuilt using bronze guides, a three angle valve job, and new Mopar Performance valve springs. 
absolutely <laughs> not a hair. If you watch down through that tunnel that I was looking through through the grill, it was within a couple of millimeters maybe of hitting on each side. But good job. All right, so let's align that thing and put the bolts in it. Additionally, the carburetors were restored to OEM specifications, and the engine was built out and dressed to its exact assembly line appearance. Every single thing was exactly the way it appeared in 1970 when it rolled off the assembly line. This car was unveiled to the customer in the season 10 finale, episode 13. You look at these, especially, you know, collecting cars a long time, there's nothing like these Hemi motors. It's a work just, of art. I mean, the outside of the car is one thing, but yeah, look at, there is no room. But when you see it in there, you think, wow. And to date, it is the most expensive Mopar to come through the shop with an estimated value of a whopping $1.5 million. Now, this is a car that I was working with George on. My old buddy George isn't here anymore. He's still alive. We put a lot of sheet metal on this car, a ton of sheet metal. It was the kind of project that I couldn't cut him loose with because he had never done one quite like it. So I was involved pretty much every step of the way when it came to the metal work. By now, you guys have probably picked up on the fact that we're going a bit backwards to our normal process where we start in the beginning and show you the end product. In this case, we've shown you the end product and now working back. We've showed you the other cars that have been so challenging for us to build. Because I wanted to surprise you and you probably didn't see it coming. This black 1971 426 Hemi automatic tuxedo Cuda is also the catalog Cuda. This is the car that George and I started with nothing but a roof skin and reinforcement. And we built the car from the ground up. We've dubbed it the Catalog Cuda. Other than four inner structure pieces that we had to harvest from an original car, this is a brand new 1971 Cuda. We are the only people to date that have built a complete 1971 Hemi Cuda from a catalog, but to OEM specs. So right now you're looking at a car that started life in a box, a bunch of boxes, that's how it is. We had laid out all of the pieces that we were gonna be putting on that car on the floor right here in this shop behind me. We brought over an e-body frame jig and George and I started slowly and meticulously putting the car together just like you would build a house from the foundation up. So in this case, the foundation was the rear frame rails, two brand new frame rails and a shock cross member for the back rear cross member for the bumper and rear body panel support. We moved our way forward and we put the front frame rails in place. Then you tie those together with the main floor, the rear step wells, the under seat panel, and the trunk floor. Now you have a foundation. Very important that all those pieces are exactly where they're supposed to go because you're gonna build up from now. So if you're off a millimeter down there, you're gonna be off 20 millimeters at the top. You're gonna be hogging out holes. So when those are in, we go to the vertical panels. That's gonna be the A pillar and the B pillar, the firewall, the outer wheelhouses, the quarter inner structure pieces, the ones I told you weren't made, and begin building out from there. Once we had it to a really nice point where Will could jump on it and do the paint work, we had him jump in and just cover that thing in paint. Beautiful, right? We could never have that access to a car that had a roof on it. That's how we chose to do that. And so from there, we worked forward. We put on our front inner structure pieces, which is left and right hand apron core support, upper cowl panel, rockers. All of those things were built and fabricated for the car right down to installing an original roof on the car. This was one structure that we knew for a fact how it was built and it had to drop exactly on what we had built below it. And it did. Stay tuned. With metalwork, bodywork, paint, and final assembly in the rear view, the very first Graveyard Cars catalog CUDA is complete. That means it's time for Mark to take this gorgeous powerhouse Hemi CUDA on its maiden voyage. 
but will their very first, built from the ground up, 71 CUDA survive its initial test run? Or will the owner's dream car fail to cross the finish line? Hmm. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. So when you add up the total number of metal pieces, all of the small infrastructure pieces, the things you don't even see that have to go into building a car like this, it was over 100 pieces of new metal. But when we were done and it's sitting there on that frame jig, it looked like a real live 1971 CUDA, the way it's supposed to, with really no more than just about three or four original parts. So when you look at our project done, I would look at it like an erector set. It's panel by panel, piece by piece for any of you that have ever built one or a model car. Starts out in a box and you just begin putting it together. It's a long, arduous, expensive process, but in the end, you've got gold. You've got gold, Jerry. You got black gold, Texas tea. Talking Beverly Hillbillies, man. When he's out shooting us some food and up coming out of oil, remember? So when I stand back and I say, folks, this is the world's first catalog CUDA, take it in, because now you know exactly what went into it. You can stand back with me and pridefully look at something like that and say, wow, there's a car that maybe wasn't even a car in the beginning, but it's a car now. I've never seen anyone build a car from scratch and take a few pieces from an original car and build a brand new one, but we sure did. People restore these, you're running out of cars, original cars laying around. Basically just get in a car, hop it on a catalog, and then you can kind of pick out what you want to do. And I noticed the cars that we're doing, Mark would never touch anything that wasn't 100% OE. But the times have changed a little bit. So unless it's a high dollar car, we're kind of changing with the times. Hope it continues. This 1971 Plymouth Barracuda features the legendary 426 Hemi topped with ProFlow 4 fuel injection and backed up with an A41 four-speed automatic transmission. The front suspension features power rack and pinion steering, a one and a quarter inch sway bar, power disc brakes, and coil over shocks. The paint is PPG's 9300 and is topped with a Phoenix Graphics white billboard. Optional equipment includes fender mounted turn signal indicators, left and right hand outside chrome racing mirrors, rear window louvers, rear spoiler, front road lamps, a monochromatic grille, and it all rides on Krager SS wheels with BF Goodrich radial TA tires. The interior of our catalog CUDA features all new OER parts, including a rim blow steering wheel, Raleigh instrument cluster with 8,000 RPM tachometer, black vinyl bucket seats, and tinted glass. And finally, we topped off the world's first catalog CUDA with a classic auto air retrofit climate control system that allows you to cruise around in air conditioned comfort year round. Once we were completely finished with the car, but before it shipped, the owner had asked me to see if I could round everybody up to sign it. Everybody who was involved in it and some people that weren't. And so we did that. We got together. Alyssa just had her baby. So I had to coerce her into coming down. She came down on a Sunday and she came down with her whole family and got in there and signed it. And I thought that was really neat. She went a real effort to get that done. But, but in the end, everybody who helped bring that car to life is signed in the trunk lid.
you know, over the years, we've saved a lot of cars from death, brought them back from the grave. That's our moniker. And the gray cars, numbers matching cars, Hemi cars, Wayne cars. This one will have a special place in my heart because it's a very, very first catalog to the very first car we built from scratch. It's an honor to be able to work with the team that I have here. They're phenomenal technicians. They have all come around so far. Some of them were great when they started here. Other ones have learned the skill sets. Take Brian. Brian, he hasn't been here, what, six months, and he's completely built a car from scratch. That's amazing. I am honored to be able to work with a great team, great shop, great sponsors, great everybody. The reason I've made such a big deal out of it being a catalog CUDA is the fact that these cars are drying up. They are. They didn't build that many in the beginning. Here we are 55 years later almost. There's less and less and less. So now I've got the opportunity, those who can afford it, that can call me up and say, build me that car. Something, quick note. The inner structure pieces that we had to use to make this car, AMD now makes them for some ironic reason. And we all know they were sitting back watching the old tray put a car together. But they are now making all of the infrastructure pieces for the roof so I can do 100%. You call me up, I'll build you a car. The only thing is, you won't have a Chrysler VIN number on it. You'll have an assigned state VIN like if you put a 32 Ford Coupe together. But looking at it down the road, Walter P. Chrysler would say, wow, that looks like a car we built. And the most important thing to me uh, of all of it, I think at the end of the day, is being blessed enough to make the kind of money I'm making right now. It's sick. I just got my tax return for 2022 and it's like, <laughs> what the heck is going on there, you know? Now, obviously I say that stuff for, so you guys can laugh, but if you put that out there, then they're gonna say that's what Mark's about. And it's not what I'm about. I'm, I'm kidding about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I like the money. <laughs> Mark Warman. Nice to meet you, Mark. Good to see you. How are you? Good. Beautiful looking cars, man. Yeah, this is where dreams happen. That's why it's Graveyard Dreams, man. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm the dream maker. <laughs> I, what I are you looking you. for? I've got anything you're looking for. So yours is more like that. Yeah. You had one in school. 68. Bronze metallic. Okay. Beautiful white interior. Like oh, that, man, but clean. But, yeah, very clean. <laughs> I'll make that car out there look exactly like that car right there. Looking forward to it, buddy. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You did it. <laughs>